This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 57. This week, we're talking all about the military aircraft made famous in the 1986 hit movie, Top Gun. Uh, Jello, uh, maybe a senior moment, but didn't we already do the F-14 Tomcat? Um, yeah, Sunshine, but I mean the other notorious aircraft featured in the movie, Top Gun. Oh, the MiG-28? Wait, hold on, didn't Paco already talk to us about the F-5? (sighs) <sighs> All right. Well, it wasn't really in the movie, Sunshine, but the oh, threat okay. of having to fly one was... Oh! But you remember one thing. You screw up just this much, you'll be flying a cargo plane full of rubber dog sh- out of Hong Kong. Yes, sir! Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapons systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. That's right, we're talking about the C-2 Greyhound today oh, yeah. with our buddy, retired United States Navy Lieutenant Commander Julio Galvan. But first, let's say hello to retired United States Commander Brian Sinclair. How's it going there, Sunshine? Hey, Jello, it's going well, man. How about yourself? Oh, everything is just going peachy, man. Here we are, what, late (laughs) September, and everyone's back at school. Everything's trucking along. Anything new in your world? No, just the same old stuff at work and uh, just enjoying it. So I'm very stoked about this interview because, unfortunately, I never got to work with J-Lo at the depot, which uh, sounds like a great guy. So anyway, so I'm very excited for the audience to hear the interview. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because on other episodes that might not be quite as, mm, let's call it uh, enticing in its title, some people have said, you know, I ended up listening and I really liked it and they were surprised. So I hope anyone who's listening, stick around because JLo really does, I think, good service to the C2 Greyhound and its very vital role in carrier onboard delivery. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. But as always, first, some announcements and Sunshine, I think we have time for some listener questions today. Perfect. Well, first things first, we had a great time at Tailhook. Sunshine, we really missed you. Unfortunately, yep, sorry, one of our teammates couldn't make it. He fell ill at the last minute. But the others and I did uh, really put together a lot of great initiatives for the way ahead. And we ended up not doing any kind of Facebook Live thing. But we made a lot of good connections with different vendors there and just had a great time. And uh, maybe next year we can get you back out there, Sunshine. Would love to. And then, hey, thinking of the Facebook page. So anything new with the, uh, the groups, if you will? Yeah, so while we were there, Scott and I started a new fighter pilot podcast, Aviation Photography Enthusiast Facebook group, and man, it blew up. Already over 250 members. Nice. And the idea is that they share their best photos, their favorite equipment, tips and techniques, and just anyone who's interested in photographing these amazing machines can go on there. You have to request to be accepted. It's a closed group, but eh, we'll take most comers if you are into aviation photography, and it's just a place to hang out with like-minded people. And it was a great litmus, Sunshine, because as soon as I can get some help, and I don't mean by you, that wasn't a veiled uh, (laughs) uh, request, but, you know, we've got some other people we're bringing to the team, and as soon as they get done with their airline training and everything else, I really, really want to start a group, and I don't know what we'll call it yet, but for the young student naval aviator where they can exchange information like these photographers. Yeah, great idea, and I I did uh, join the group, that aviation photography group, and- Oh, cool pretty amazing photos and i think we kind of do some good synergy here in that you know the weekly tech talks Mm -hmm. i think i'll dive in i'm going to ask the photographers for their permission but then i'll post some of their work on the uh, weekly the friday tech talks and then we'll uh, kind of provide a more scientific or engineering i guess aspect to their photos well another thing too and that's a great point is that now we have a wealth of information available for us for different subjects on aircraft but also imagery for our social media background pictures so instead of just grabbing something off the web or somewhere else we can ask our audience hey what do you think should be featured in october and depending on what we get we can feature it and give the photographer credit awesome idea and yeah i just say that this is the between the facebook page and the podcast stuff i would say that we're capturing kind of the rich pageantry of aviation if that makes sense so we got all these guys stories all these aircraft characteristics and pictures and it's just kind of a a living history i guess you can say right of aviation rich pageantry (laughs) dude that's why you're on the show man i love it i would not have come up with that (laughs) i read that somewhere just kidding (laughs) Uh, fair enough 
All right, let's see. What else is going on? I haven't really decided yet what's going on with Miramar. I owe everyone an answer. I'm oh, yeah. availing myself to my airline to possibly fly some more since I didn't really fly too much this month. But if they don't end up calling me, I'll probably head out there. And what I'll do is I'll just take some pictures okay, cool. and throw them on Instagram. And if people are there, you can try to find me. I'll position myself in front of an aircraft and say hello to folks. But not quite the footprint we had last year. But maybe again, like Tail, maybe we can do something a little bigger for next year. But you can't make it anyway, I think you said, right? Yeah, right. Right now, it doesn't look good. I've got a business trip, but then I still want to get my girls, I get my family really out there. We have yet to go to the Miramar Air Show. So, man, my it's fingers right crossed. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hey, what do you say we take some listener questions? Let's go for it. Hey, the first one is from Hayden. All right. He says, please briefly explain collateral duties for an aviator, what you may have had, what you wish you had had, which one you definitely did not want, etc. So Jello, do you want to kind of, I remember, I think in an earlier episode, we did talk about the ground jobs, right? Or the collateral Mm -hmm. duties. Do you want to just kind of touch on the organization there? Yeah. So let's caveat this with yours and my experiences, Sunshine, are in Navy single seat squadrons for the most part. Now, if you want to talk about S3 stuff, you can, but I don't know about the Air Force. I don't know about the Marine Corps or the two seat squadrons, but in a single seat Navy VFA, let's start at the top and work down because that might be easier. So you have the command officer and the executive officer, and they'll have various collateral duties just because of their position and rank. But for the most part, that is their primary duty is to lead the squadron. And then you have your department heads and Sunshine, tighten us up on the generally four departments that the department heads will fill. Yes, you've got your maintenance officer, Uh you've got your operations officer, you've got your admin, and you've got your safety officer. Okay, there you go. And within those, depending on the squadron, again, most VFA single seats, you'll probably bounce around into at least three of those. And not everyone will go to safety school, so sometimes you won't get that position. But within each of those, now you have the junior officers who are going to have different billets within, let's say, operations, you might be the schedule writer or the NATO. Well, actually, NATOPS is under safety, right? but you might be the schedule writer or one of the WTOs, the weapons tactics officers, like for air to air or air to surface. And then Sunshine, remind us what you have like in the maintenance department. Yeah, in the maintenance department, so you have a division, and those divisions are further broken down into branches. So you could have the AVARM divo, which would be the avionics armament, if you will, so the AOs and the ATs. Mm-hmm. So, and those are traditionally going to be obviously the lower level. So that would be assigned to the junior officers, right? So the lieutenants and the uh, lieutenant JGs, if those exist in single seat squadrons. Right. Hey, just thinking of the JO job. So the things that I didn't want, and then it turned out I actually really enjoyed Jello was first lieutenant. Were you ever the first lieutenant officer? Oh, I was briefly. Yes. Okay. So first lieutenant, for those that don't know, is kind of first lieutenant division, kind of the guys in charge of cleanliness. So and not mm-hmm. personal hygiene, obviously we're talking about the hangar and the workspaces. So I would say that I was kind of the head janitor, if you will. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I wasn't always mucking out stalls necessarily, but making sure that my guys had the tools and clearly defined missions so they can go and execute. So that would yeah. be keeping things clean and refilled and all that stuff. And to me, the first lieutenant was traditionally the new guys in the squadron, right? So brand new, fresh boots, if you are fresh out of boot camp anyway, and they're, maybe right. they're designated or not. And I thought it was going to be a drag, but honestly, I felt like I really was able to influence those guys as newcomers because they were pretty much a clean slate coming into the squadron. So in the end, it turned out I really enjoyed the first lieutenant division officer job. How about you, Jello? I didn't have a job I didn't like because like I try to encourage young people who ask me, you try to make the most of anything you get and not Absolutely. dwell on what you're not getting or what someone else is getting. So if you get a job like that, you get to hone your leadership skills or motivational skills. Because some of those young men and women, I'm guessing you dealt with this, Sunshine, they're wondering what decision they made and why are they where they are cleaning latrines and floors and everything else. And so it's an opportunity for you to really inspire the young men and women. And then if you're writing the schedule, you get to dictate who goes and flies. And if you're a W WTO, then you get to get ready for tactics. In my case, getting ready for, I uh, was the air-to-air WTO, and it, it was a good warm-up for going to Top Gun. So I didn't really find a job I didn't like. Nice. And I really do like your shout-out to the Army there when you called the head the latrine jello. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> as soon as I push the record button, Sunshine, I never know what's going to come out. And so, in fact, we're going to It's like a box of chocolates, of baby. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see that here in the episode coming up. All right. Hey, why don't we take a phone call next? Hey, Jello and Sunshine. My name is John. I'm from San Diego, California. I'm currently finishing my degree at UC San Diego. I was just wondering what's considered a flight hour. 
is it wheels up to wheels down or is it engines on to engines off? I was just wondering about that. Further, I was wondering if it's considered differently between maintenance personnel and pilots. Say I have the engines on for 150 hours, but only fly 100 hours. Would the maintenance personnel log that as 100 hours on the aircraft or 150 hours? Love the podcast. Thanks. All right, John, right here from San Diego. Thanks for the call. Sunshine, I'll take the first part if you want to take the second, because this is an easy one, at least for fixed wing. As soon as you release brakes on takeoff roll, the clock starts, and after you land, you get to add five minutes. So if you took off at exactly 8, landed at exactly 9, it would be till 9.05, and you would log a 1.1. I don't know what it is for rotary wing, but uh, what is it uh, for the engines and other components? Yeah, so uh, big picture is the 4790, our maintenance manual, right, talks about there's two systems they use, UMA, O-O-M-A, for optimized organizational maintenance activity, or FAME, that's specific to the F-18, so that's uh, F for F-18, Autonomous Maintenance Environment. They not only track hours or flight hours, but they're also going to track operating hours and number of cycles or a number of events. So like for the gun, it would be number of round shot. For the tail hook, it could be number of hits, right? Number of time that the tail hook is dropped and it hits either the carrier deck or grabs a wire. So okay. they track all that stuff. It's not just flight hours as uh, John mentioned earlier. And I have to think, although I don't know that much about it, but the F-35 has, has to be even way more advanced. In fact, I'm told some of it is beamed back to base even before the aircraft lands. Yeah, I think that's that automated logistics and information system, ALICE. I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here. I think that's what it's called, ALIS. Yeah. But yeah. I think Skosh mentioned that way back on our fourth versus fifth, but we still owe everybody an F-35 episode, so maybe we can bring that up. Indeed. Excellent. All right, how about a couple more questions? Terry from Singapore asks, how effective are U.S. military aviation selection programs in rejecting candidates who do not have the aptitude to be fighter pilots. Why, well, Jella, doesn't that kind of go hand in hand with their the other question? I think it was from Josh, right, in Wisconsin. Oh, and yeah, what asked, was that one? Something like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here it is. Does the right stuff really exist? Are there some pilots that just have it and those who don't? Yeah, and he puts right stuff in quotes there. And, you know, I, such a, I don't know how to answer the first question. I mean, I know that there were people in squadrons that seemed a little weaker than others, and even a lot of them end up blossoming later. And then the people who didn't show up, well, I was never a training command instructor, so I don't know who didn't show up or how good or bad they would have been. So that's a tough one for me to answer. Yeah, I'd say that they're not 100% effective, obviously. We still have, and that would be judged based on, the metric would be attrition, right? People who either get kicked out or decide to DOR drop on request during the actual flight program itself. So the Air Force has their own way of doing mm-hmm. flight school and the Navy's is slightly different. And uh, we, I'm just going to focus on the Navy's obviously, but we have our uh, IFS, uh, I think it's called introductory flight screener, right? Where you go up in a Cessna, you get about 10 hours and you, tr- you try to learn or try to demonstrate really that you can aviate, navigate and communicate. That's right. And then there's obviously steps along the way, both in primary to advanced and it's kind of a crawl walk run right so you start in your Cessna and then you get in your now nowadays I guess it's a T6 right and then and from there then you're going to jump into a T45 so the thought let's see the rigor I guess increases wouldn't you say as the approach speeds increase if that makes sense absolutely and then once you get to the FRS you're flying the fleet representative aircraft and so yeah, I have to think they're doing a good job. And I certainly know when I went through that there were people who didn't make it. A good friend of mine was unable to make it and had to find a different job other than flying. So that's a tough one. I'm not sure how to answer that, Terry. But what do you think of Josh's question, Sunshine? Oh, the right stuff. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. So I remember reading somewhere back in the Chuck Yeager era, this wasn't necessarily Chuck Yeager who said it, but they said that Pilots just sometimes they have the moral fiber or they don't to be fighter pilots. Mm. And so, uh, but with the advancement of automation, I would still say that there are the guys that have it and the guys that don't, but I don't think it's going to be the same as it used to be in the 60s, if that makes sense, right? So nowadays I would think of our fighter pilots, I hate to say this, but aren't they more airborne system operators? Oh, let's not even go down this path. I mean, okay, let's not go down. <laughs> <laughs> sitting in my airline, by the way, that's all I do. I fly the airplane by pushing buttons and dialing <laughs> knobs. But, you know, I'm guessing you can think of a handful of guys too, Sunshine, but there's just a couple in my 25 years that I look back at and I think, man, that guy was the total package. He was smart, articulate, oh, yeah. a good flyer. He was easy to instruct and was good at instructing. Mm -hmm. He was pleasant. He was always high energy. You know, he wasn't moody. And to me, that was the right stuff. Now, did anyone ever say that about Jello Aiello? I don't think so. (laughs) But I can think of a handful of guys that they did. And 
I just really count myself as blessed to have been around them because I always looked at it as, you know, that's not me. I mean, I hate to admit it, but I had my moments where I was just grouchy about something and I wore it on my sleeve. I'm half Italian. I'll blame it on that. And, and there were <laughs> other days when I was high on life and everyone knew it and, and everything in between. And, and the guys that were more level-headed, I really respected them. But, but the guys who were just solid behind the boat, got the job done, and that everyone looked up to, I would say they had the right stuff. And I, I knew a handful of those guys. Yeah, I did too. I'd say very social creatures. Plus, they were very consistent. I think when you say had you know did mm-hmm. did it correctly behind the boat is consistency, and from those metrics, honestly, Jello, I would say that I was a fleet average pilot at best. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, and uh, yeah. I think that's a great answer to uh, Josh's question. Well, you know, enough people have heard us say that on this show that I feel comfortable doing it because I think it's part of our shtick on this show is that you and I don't claim to be something we're not. I mean, we were average dudes arguably and we're just now sharing it with everyone else and what you hear is what you get i guess i agree well hey bud that's it for the listener questions for this week why don't we get into the interview and before you reflect on it i want to just say two things now first i recorded this with jlo back at the end of june and we still had my old audio system set up so there are a couple parts unless our magician bernie can edit them out where there's just a couple audio clips uh from the old days so it kind of throws you back a little bit but hopefully those in the future won't be present anymore and then also i recorded this prior to my interview with Sweet Pea. So as I'm talking about the crew served weapon on the ramp of the V-22, you'll hear some question in my voice because at that time I wasn't familiar with it. But of course, now we've had that episode. So Sunshine, you listened to it. What did you think of the interview? I wish that once again, I would have served at the depot with JLo. Sounds like a great American. So, and just, I love the way you guys are going to go back and forth and describe this workhorse that I'll tell you what, it doesn't make it onto the glossy brochure. It may not even be in the calendar, right? But when it goes down and, and the mission is aborted, I'll tell you what, it's going to be the first line on the complaint form from the fleet, right? Hey, we need our stuff out on the boat. So it's huge in just the logistics and part chain and also just morale too, right? I'd say that's the fun boat coming in. That's what we used to call it. No doubt. All right. Well, why don't we let JLo tell us all about it? All right, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is once again in the Pacific Northwest. I'm in Gig Harbor in the state of Washington, and I am in the home of my very good friend, retired United States Navy Lieutenant Commander Julio Galvan. J-Lo, how you doing, bud? I'm doing great, J-Lo. It's great to be here. Thanks for uh, coming up. Oh, you bet. And I hope people don't get confused. You're J-Lo and I'm Jello. Yeah. But at least I'm only calling you and you're calling me. And (laughs) anyway, (laughs) my eyes are already crossed and everybody else is like, what? I got this. Okay. Awesome, dude. Well, we have been hanging out at your place here all day, and we are going to talk about the mighty C2 Greyhound. Are you down for that? Yeah, dude. I'm pretty excited. All right, good. It's been fun hanging out with you today, and we've been trying to put this together for, what, several months? It's been a while. I think it's almost been a year now. That's right. Well, we've known each other since, I think, 2015. Yeah. So before we get into the Greyhound, let's talk about you, dude. Where are you from? Did you have any military in your family before you? And what did you do in the military? What are you doing now? Yeah. Yeah. My dad was in the Navy. He did uh, 35 years, over 35 years in the United States Navy. Wow. He was in the submarine force. I would be remiss to say, you know, my dad was in the Navy. But my, mom, my mom was a Navy wife, which I think uh, is worth mentioning. So being raised in that, that was kind of inspiring. I'm sorry if you hear my dog shaking. That's Argo. He's, uh, <laughs> he wasn't making any noise until we rolled tape. <laughs> he's uh, he's so. getting rid of his fleas. Uh, right, anyway, no so that was a big part of my life. And so... You know, I can remember being in high school thinking, what am I going to do? I remember hearing the career counselor saying, uh, listen, your future's bright uh, with uh, acceptance letters to Harvard and Yale. Uh, anything's open. And uh, You had that? No, oh. she wasn't talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the office talking to the principal about some sort of difference of opinion I was having with another uh-huh. student. Gotcha. But I remember thinking that's what I want. So I did make an appointment with the career counselor. And it turns out that my grade in community service didn't. A warrant that. So okay. I took my talents to the United States Navy and I went to the submarine force uh, where I served there on the USS Elm in the rivers. It was a sealed delivery boat. We had like another little submarine inside our submarine. Whoa. And then I went to uh, college. I went to Boost, which is an en- enlisted commissioning program. And then mm-hmm. I got sent to the University of Idaho, where I went to the ROTC there. I got commissioned. And instead of going back to submarines, I thought I'd throw my hat in naval aviation. And I did. I selected C2s. And I flew in both operational squadrons, VRC-40 on the East Coast, VRC-30. I was a T-45 flight instructor. I did a small stint down at uh, U.S. Central Command in Tampa and overseas. And then I was also a depot pilot, and that's where I met you. Yeah. 
And now I'm a, uh, a line pilot and a flight instructor for a legacy airline, Excellent. Love and Life. Up here in uh, the Seattle area. p and well, You are in good shape. Plus, you got a little slice of heaven out here in the woods. You got some land to work on and uh, a lot of stuff going on. You got Apples. 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 That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that is quite the background. And how many years of service? Uh, joined the Navy in June of 91, and I retired in uh, August of 2015. I did uh, about four years of, of reserve time while I was in ROTC. So we'll call it 24-ish yeah. or so. That yeah. sounds good. And enlisted and officer. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. Not Thank everybody you. does that. Yeah. So thanks for your service. I always save that to the end normally, but I got ahead of myself. All right, dude. Well, we are going to talk about the aircraft you flew. But yeah. this being the Fighter Pilot Podcast, j I got to ask you, why have you been trying to get me up here to talk about this thing? I mean, come on. It's a C2. It's kind of ugly. No offense. It doesn't really have a glamorous role. It's kind of, you know. Well, know. says you, man. <laughs> it's very glamorous. And let me tell you, if you don't know, uh, since the dawn of uh, any war, whether you're fighting a small conflict or a world war, it's always been about uh, supplying the people in the most farthest parts of the world. And I'll take from a quote. I think I heard you say it earlier. You said something about beans, band-aids, and bullets, right? Well, if you're right. going to go to war, you're going to need bullets and toilet paper. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have those bullets and toilet paper in the right place at the right time, it's going to get messy. The COD is the last golden mile in the supply chain to the carrier strike group. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't have the COD, it's going to get messy. All right. Well, let's start with basics. And I don't mean toilet paper and getting messy because that sounds awful. What is COD? Right. That's a great question. So... I'll be at fault for saying COD when it's interchangeably referenced to a C- the C-2 aircraft. So the C-2A Greyhound is currently the Navy's vehicle for doing the COD mission. And what does COD stand for? Yeah, COD is an acronym for Carrier On Board. And Carrier On Board has been going on since the carrier was around. Just a side note, the, the C-2A Greyhound, which I'll get into, I guess, maybe a little bit later, that's the only aircraft from the blueprints from the infancy that's ever been designed to do the COD mission. There's been... Uh, a lot of other aircraft that were designed for other missions, and they did the COD mission. Mm. Um, in the 40s and the 50s, you had the TBM-3 Avenger, which is actually what President Bush flew. Bush H- one, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. He got shot down in the Avenger. Well, they converted that. Grumman converted that into a COD. Whoa. And then they had the S-2... Um, tracker. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, S-2 Tracker, predecessor to the S-3. Well, they converted that into the C-1A Trader. And then the Navy experimented with like the C-130. With that didn't go <laughs> did very well. Go I think well no. There were some issues <laughs> they had with that. They In the late 60s, they took the design, Grumman took the design of the E-2 and made a, a variant or a derivative, if you will, and made the C-2A Greyhound. Wider okay. fuselage, different avionics, but mainly the wings and the... Uh, minus the fuselage and some other things, right. kind of made the plane there. In the 70s, 80s, there was the US-3 that, that kind of converted into a COD, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. And so since the late 60s, the C-2A Greyhound has been the primary vehicle for the COD to do the COD mission. Um, yeah. So and then, carrier onboard delivery. You are literally carrying logistics and people back and forth from the carrier aircraft carrier specifically to the shore, no matter where the carrier is. That's right. And we're the only aircraft that's ever been designed to do that. There's no one else in the world that does what the U.S. Navy does with the C-2 Greyhound. We do fixed wing logistics supply to the carrier up until, oh gosh, memory's failing me, maybe 2004, 2005, they even did night ops where they did night traps with passengers or or cargo. I mean, it Mm -hmm. was Debt 5 led the way with that out in Japan. But yeah, no one else does what we do. We Passengers on board the ship via fixed wing. And to your point, the aircraft carrier cannot do what it does. And the F-18s and the F-14s and everything you see in Hollywood and in books and the videos on YouTube or whatever, all about that sexy part of it. But none of that happens without you guys. That's true. And, and you know, you've said that several times and it's accurate. It doesn't look sexy because it just doesn't. I remember the very first time I saw the C-2. I was a midshipman and I walked up to the flight deck while the plane was flying, and I thought, man, what what a, I don't know, this is a rated G podcast, right? What, what, what a POS, like, I, I would never fly that thing, and I think I jinxed myself because I ended up flying, and I selected yeah. the C2, but I love it, you know, and it doesn't look sexy, but into the eye of the beholder and the eye of the people who fly it, mm. we love it, and it's the most beautiful plane out there. Well, and I'll tell you, I can 
attest to this personally, to the folks on the carrier who have been out maybe at sea for a month without a port visit, and maybe for whatever reason the internet is down, or at least it's so constricted you can't barely do emails. Man, when you guys show up, it's beautiful. Because guess what it's bringing? Yeah. Letters and packages. Right. Still, in the 2010 decade, we still rely on that out there on deployment to get those little bits from home. Everything. Mm-hmm. McDonald's, uh, VIPs. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, we bring everything. Awesome. All right, so we got ahead of ourselves here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast in the aircraft series that we are in the midst of. We usually start with what was it designed to do? And you've already said that. So this is designed from the beginning, only aircraft in history, to be a land to ship and ship to land delivery vehicle for beans, bullets, band aids, people. Anything and everything that needs to get out there. Now, with reason. We'll get to performance in a little bit, right? You can't take a whole full fuel load of um, of gold bars or something extremely heavy. I think it's, what, about 10,000 pounds? That's right. But 10,000 pounds caveated with um, we can't take 10,000 pounds of cargo and 26 passengers. Right. It, it's just the payload. So, yeah. So, amount. you have limits. But right. the point being is that that is what you do. That is your mission. And then normally our second question is what does it do well? And I think you're going to make a case for this is what it's designed to do, and it does it pretty well, right? Yeah, and, and you ask, what does it do well? I think I'd like to break that up into maybe uh, two questions, yeah. what it does and, and what it does well. It pretty much just does one thing. You know, it's just, that's it. It just does one thing. And that's transporting high priority cargo and passengers to and from the ship. They do that from two locations, primarily the East Coast out of Norfolk, Virginia and Coronado, California with a forward detachment in Japan. This may sound like I'm going a little off subject, but what it does well is just how it operates. And so the structure of the squadrons is broken up into groups. You've got a home guard detachment, which kind of flies the plane, but you have the squadron that's broken up into detachments. And so if I can just deep drill into what it does well, detachments are able to receive short fused tasking and do amazing things. And I just like to give briefly two examples. So the Air Force, I know nothing about the Air Force, right? But I think that they have a different system than we do, like an air mobility command. Look, mm-hmm. So for instance, when Katrina rolled in in 2005, the hurricane hit and it was just chaos, right? Well, I got tasking the night before hey, the storm is about to pass. And we flew into Katrina the very next day, taking water and people. And a lot of planes can't do that because the runway's wet or it's fouled. And we went down there, it was crazy. And then another example of short fusing is, is we're flying out of the Middle East. The ship is leaving, everybody's gone. And an F-18 diverts into Kandahar with a engine problem. And, I, and we get, the night before, we're packed up. All the planes are packing up. We're leaving Bahrain. And we get told, hey, go into Kandahar, rescue this plane and get out of there because we're leaving with or without you. Hmm. And we did that. And I just, I think that's a great example of the short fuse tasking that the COD detachments are able to do. And so Hmm. that's what I would say it does well. The the plane does one thing, but it's the people and the flexibility and the the versatility that's able to get things done. Well, and that's what I was about to challenge you on, because I think we're really talking about the flexibility and adaptability of the people that are involved in this mission. But certainly the aircraft is ready and is adaptable to, hey, let's get everything off that we had on and and let's go do what we need to do. But it really speaks to both the aircraft and the tenacity and the spirit of the people. Yeah, that's exactly right. And one last thing, I broke it up into two questions, what it can do and what it does well. That's Mm -hmm. what it does well. And then I would be remiss to, to not mention that we have a good relationship with the special forces out there. So Ever since I was been a C2 pilot, started in 2002 or three, we've done airdrops with the special forces, whether they've been, I think they've been Marines, they've been SEALs, they've been EOD. On the West Coast, we did a lot of stuff. We do air shows with the leapfrogs and then something that may be rarely known. And, and we've done it, I think, a fair amount, but we've never actually operationally done it, at least that I know, is we have this thing called the ADS capability, A-D-D-S. Mm. And I think it's called... Oh, gosh. I don't even know what it's called. It's like airdrop delivery system. Ads. And so <laughs> okay. imagine this, kind of like a Captain Phillips scenario where a U.S. ship or U.S. interest is in trouble out in the middle of the sea. They get, their props get tangled up in mines or wire or they get taken hostage by pirates. Well, we can load up this rebel boat and put it in the back of the cod, take off, drop the boat with all the EOD guys or the special warfare guys out in the middle of nowhere. And, and now these guys are going to get rescued by maybe a explosive team or a SEAL team. So mm-hmm. those are just a couple of things of what it can do. But what it does well is um, ship to shore cargo. There you go. 
Yeah, and so just in case people are unfamiliar, EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. And then Captain Phillips, of course, the movie was based on as well, but the uh, captain of the Maersk, Alabama, I believe it was, chronicled in the movie as far as the hostage situation with the pirates and all that. Awesome. So speaking of that, I don't know where else to put this, so I'll just ask about it here. Generally, I think of your mission as non-combatant, right? You guys are logistics, supply, kind of behind, like away from enemy lines, right? So you guys are generally... Now, when you are deploying SEALs in the scenarios you just talked about, is there an element of what you guys do that is in combat or in harm's way? Or is it mostly far from combat? Yeah, it's far from combat. I've never done that operationally. Okay. We, we've done a lot of training for it and a lot, EOD and SEALs, at least you know what I've seen, but not operational. Okay. I think it's just for the option. Sure, that, yeah. Uh, you have the ability. Again, a testament to the adaptability and flexibility of the aircraft and the mission and the people. Right. All right, so let's talk about variants of the C-2 Greyhound. We talked about where it came from already, the C-1 tracker, or sorry, Trader. Thank right? you. It was yep. the S-2 tracker. I'm sure there were some prototypes, but what happened after it became operational? Is there a C-2A, I presume? So the C-2A was developed by Grumman in the mid-60s, and I'm guessing, but I think they made like 20 of them in the 60s, and Mm -hmm. they were, you know, I don't think they lasted more than 20 years. And then in the 80s, they did a re-procurement of that. So that was the C-2A, parentheses, R, and that's the R was for re-procurement. Okay. They did, I think, 35 or 40 more in the 80s, and... That took us into maybe 1990 was the last delivery. And so that's it. And then I, I want to say in the, oh gosh, I, if you had given these questions ahead of time, I would have been prepared. <laughs> but you knew I was coming. But yeah. <laughs> um, so there was a SLEP done. SLEP is a service life extension program. Right. And so they did a lot of rewiring and basically extending the life of the airframe to, you know, X number of thousands of traps and, and flight hours. Mm-hmm. And then in the 2008 to maybe 2011, there was the transformation from a Lot 1 aircraft, which was the basic C-2A, to mm-hmm. the, the Lot 4. And so the Lot 2 and Lot 3, those were just transitional lots. They weren't permanent. But Lot 1 was the four-bladed steam gauge aircraft. And then the Lot 4 was the eight-bladed C-2 with the upgraded navigation system, CNS ATM. I wish I knew what that stood for. <laughs> that's right. We can look it up after. Yeah, that's right. All right. But I would say that's the latest and greatest C-2 was the CNS ATM slept aircraft. Hmm. Those are flying today. And I think they're going to be flying probably to the mid- 2020s, I think yeah, I read. that's right. right. Yeah. So they never bothered with all these upgrades. Even the original C-2A, then they re-procured. They didn't bother to call it a C-2B, huh? No, and For whatever and, reason, and you know, I bet the Pax guys could talk a lot more about that. I think there was a lot of Pax River, t- right? Thank mm-hmm. you. There was a lot of talk about that, like maybe putting hanging S three engines below it, or um, there was some talk about making a C two B with like kind of out of the S three. But no, there's no variance. It's okay. just what I told you. And then with the propeller change, was it the same engine? Yep. And so someone somewhere figured out that with eight blades, it's more efficient or effective or what than four blades? More efficient, less vibrations, and uh, more power. Well, that's a win all around. There's a maintenance aspect to it, too. With the four-bladed prop, whenever you had to do a change to one of the blades, I think one of the blades got damaged or there was uh, the nickel sheeting started to get worn, you had to replace and remove the whole prop. With this eight-bladed prop, you could actually move one blade and put it back in. So significant hmm cost and savings. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, let's move on to why does it look the way it does? And you've already alluded to this. So the E2 Hawkeye came around first and then the C2 Greyhound came about after. Now you're grabbing a model over here that of course our listeners can't see, but for those on Patreon, we can show a video of this afterwards for the exclusive content part. But why does it look the way it does? And I don't know where you want to start. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I grabbed the model because I had to look at it and think about why it looks well, the way it does. let's start with the tail because that's a fairly easy one, right? Yeah, that's a great one. So there are four vertical stabs on the aircraft. And so the reason there are four vertical stabs is because in order to have the amount of controllability, if we were to have one vertical stab, it would be a huge vertical stab, one big vertical stab, maybe like something like a C-130 size. Well, or anyone who's been to their local airport and seen a 747 right. or something, you know, it's one giant tail. That's not going to fit in the hangar deck. Of an aircraft carrier. Correct. And that's why something like an F-14 had two tails and then a C-2 and an E-2 have four. Yeah. Okay. And so there's a little bit more to that though. So you see four, but the actual one with the American flag on it, that's actually a, um, that's for cosmetics. It doesn't move in any way. So there are three rudders, um, 
there's a rudder on the outboard. There's a rudder on the, I guess maybe that's the, like the number three spot. But the one with the American flag, that's actually for cosmetics. Hmm. I guess the higher-ups didn't think it would look great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's why that is. And, and I don't know, I don't want to do a deep dive here unless people are interested. But long story short, the critical engine is the left engine. So... If we were to lose the right engine, the controllability we only need, we only need a certain amount of surface area. So that one rudder here on the outboard will give us controllability if we lose the right engine. Now, if we lose the left engine, we're actually going to need both of these to maintain controllability. So that's why that one's just for cosmetics. And I don't know if I lost anybody No, you probably didn't. And if our co-host Sunshine were here, I'm guessing he would jump in and say it has to do with the direction that the propeller is rotating. And so because it's on the left and it's rotating, I presume, uh, to the left or to the right, whichever direction it's rotating, (laughs) because there's the different factors of where it is and where it's rotating, that one side is, again, more critical than the other. You you learn this in multi-engine training early on. In jet engines, it's not so big a deal, but in propeller aircraft, it certainly is. Okay. Hey, just to break it down, if you were to get a bicycle wheel and spin it, Mm -hmm. it may be awkward to turn. That's what that P factor is. Right. And so we use that to our advantage with the left engine. Okay. So that the, carries the whole plane. When, it's like a when, gyroscopic effect or something along those lines. Yeah. All right. And then we talked about the fact that the fuselage, again, the whole airplane looks like an E2 minus the big radar dome on top, but also the fuselage is larger on this one than an E2. And why is that? Well, if you look at the fuselage on the E2, it's fairly skinny. There's enough for three people to sit back there and some equipment. Our fuselage has got enough for four seats across with a aisle down the middle and it's got a big ramp in the back, and that ramp is to load cargo. So the fuselage is, is unique to this aircraft, and um, yeah, it's just to load cargo. Yeah, I mean, there's no point in having a skinny fuselage if the whole purpose of the aircraft is to carry things. Right, and then so the fuselage, <laughs> exactly, the fuselage complements the wingspan, and the wingspan's, you know, the max LA area. I think it's 90 feet in LA, and so our wingspan, I think, is just right at 80 feet. So Yeah, so we'll get to that in a little bit, but when you are landing on the carrier then there's not a lot of extra room on both sides. So lineup is very important for this aircraft. One more thing, though, the nose is pretty bulbous. And I've always wondered, is there something in the nose? Is there a little weather radar or anything else up in there? There is. There's okay. a weather radar. There's radios below the um, there's navigation communication equipment, but there's okay. nav equipment below the pilots, and then there's a weather radar up front. Okay. And then talk to us about the wings. On an F-14, they could sweep them back. On an mm-hmm. F-18, we can fold the tips. On an A-4, they didn't do either of those because it had such a narrow wingspan. But what happens on the C-2 and why? Yeah. Golly, it's kind of hard to describe. So well, I don't they, mean exactly like the mechanics of it, but... Right. They sweep back, but then they go vertical. So imagine how the F-14 <laughs> just sweeps back while right. ours actually turn vertical. So and They like rotate and... Pivot, thank you. They, essentially, thank right? you. They rotate 90 degrees down and then they pivot up. And so on the rudders, there's this big, oh gosh, I don't know what to call it, but it's basically a, a, a hanging hook that the wings, a jury strut is what it's called. So the jury strut sticks out of the wing and it catches on the the back rudder and it hangs up there. And so if you can just imagine getting your arms and folding them back right behind you, palms facing each other, that's what it looks like. It's kind of funky looking. Yeah. Well, we uh, hope if we have the time, uh, we can uh, do a behind the scenes on this aircraft with you when we're done here. Yeah. And we can show people that in a uh, uh, popular YouTube video. So, yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to armament. Now, this might be a short discussion. Yeah. But what armament does this particular aircraft carry? A couple things. We have uh, flares. <laughs> In the, uh, okay. We have flares in the SV2. We've got a survival knife. All right. <laughs> and then uh, just going back to, on a serious note, going back to uh, when I sent my guys into Kandahar, we went up to uh, the leadership and said, hey, we're going into Kandahar. Um, we're going to need some weapons. And so mm-hmm. they issued us weapons. They're like, do you guys know how to use these? And we're like, yeah, we've seen it done on the movies. <laughs> so they gave us weapons and then we flew in and right. took care of those guys. But now, that's it. By weapons, you mean like nine millimeter you know, pistols? I, I couldn't tell you what they were. I don't know. But they gave us weapons. So, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty bad. All right. Yeah. So the C-130, I believe it is, has the Moab, right? The mother of all bombs that comes oh, out of right. its tail. Right, right, right. Um, there's other giant bombs. You guys have no mission where some massive ordnance comes out of the tail of a C2? No. All right. We can dump fuel. And that's then, about it. Light it on fire. <laughs> we don't want to do that, though. You can shout angry words. <laughs> that's what about, right. I think there's a, maybe it's the V-22 that also has a crew-served weapon that can be mounted on the tail and fired out from the rear. Any crew-served weapons out the doors or tail of the C2? 
Not that I know of. So it really is intended to be flown in a permissive environment. Right. We have a okay. glossy paint job. <laughs> we do. Very good. Well, this is probably as good a place as any then to talk about this, right? Because you guys, you kind of belong to the air wing, right? When we deploy. But like you said, you've got the two squadrons, one on each coast, and then a detachment in Japan. But let's say kind of hearkening back to when I deployed my final time, well, at least from the West Coast of the United States in Air Wing 11 in 2005. It was the deployment where the PBS guys came out and did the carrier special. Now, a detachment of you guys came out with us. So tell us briefly how that works. In other words, how many aircraft, how many people, and do you stay with the carrier the whole time or do you go off and kind of leapfrog along with us or what do you do? Yeah, great question. So the first person I would say is uh, the OIC is, excuse me, the officer in charge is the person who's in charge of the attachment. He's actually selected by big Navy. There's a board where he goes to and he's selected and- in, in, Almost like selecting a commanding officer. Right. Okay. Right. Probably not as hard, but you're right. The department head and slash OIC. So he's picked up by bupers and sent to one of the squadrons. He's then uh, sent to the squadron and the squadron is built up around pilots who are aircraft commanders and then pilots who need- time to become aircraft commanders. There's air crew out there that complement us. I think we carry between six and eight air crew. And then we have maintainers. And And I don't want to use the word support personnel because uh, we don't have support personnel. Every single person is a vital part of that team. There is no support people. Every person's important. And so it's approximately 45 people, give or take, people that deploy with the squadron. And so we fly on board, usually right from Coronado, and then we'll make a stop in Hawaii, spend a few days in Hawaii, and we'll do forward hits, so meaning we'll leave, we'll go ahead of the ship, and then we'll support the ship while it actually transits right through Hawaii, and then mm-hmm. it's actually passing Hawaii, and we'll fly on, and then we'll hop on, and um, maybe Guam will be the next stop, but there's options. There's uh, Wake and other options out there, and then Guam will do some hits, you know, Japan, and obviously Korea are options, and then you can go south down to there's a lot of options. There's the Pacific Theater and then there's the Middle East Theater. So, for instance, when I was at OIC, we went to um, Guam and then we went to um, Malaysia, went to Kota Kinabalu, we went into Singapore, and then we flew from the North Arabian Sea, we flew into uh, Bahrain and we did a lot of ops out of uh, Bahrain where we supported North Arabian Gulf and the North Arabian Sea. In other words, when we leave San Diego and it's a big open open ocean, you guys are going to come on board. And so you're going to stay on board just like we do in our F-18 squadrons or whatever. And then when we get close enough to the next point, which is Hawaii, we might shoot one or both airplanes off ahead. And so they can go with some crew, your own guys in the back and gals. And then you might set up like a beach debt, right? As we call it. And then from there, Admiral Schmuckatelli from Pacific Fleet or whatever can say, hey, I want to go visit the Carl Vinson or whatever ship. Right. And then you can fly back and forth. So mail might be waiting in Hawaii for us. There might be supplies that the ship needs. And so as the ship is getting close, you can run people and things back and forth. But let's say it's not stopping. So as the ship's getting close... As it's passing by, you're doing hits all day. And then at some point before the ship gets too far away, you pack up the beach debt and jump back aboard, right? That's right. And hop on. Now, what happens if we are close enough where you can go, let's say, from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur up to Bahrain? Do you get back on the ship or do you just kind of leapfrog alongside the ship from shore to shore? There's no standard route or no standard practice. It's all what the ship needs. And and I'm going to see if I can explain this next point. When the U.S. aircraft transits big ocean and then, I don't know, oh gosh, the words archipelagic areas. Where there's lots of islands, in other words, right? right? So you cannot just send a aircraft carrier through someone's backyard and just keep going. Out of respect, the U.S. Navy is like, listen, we're passing through. We're going to stop and tip our hat and, and bring people aboard and, you know, show them that we're on the same team here. And mm-hmm. so that's what happens a lot of times when we're transiting through, we're showing goodwill. We're flying people aboard and giving them a do for a day or two and then flying them back. So dignitaries from other right. countries, perhaps. Now, I might make an argument on that case because I think there are certain sea lanes that the Navy, as it has for over 200 years, will say, hey, look, this is international law. Sure. We are allowed to go through. And we're going to show that to you by... Bo- <laughs> 
just going that's through, right. right? And you're not going to get a visit. That's right. <laughs> but there are others where we try to do in goodwill, say, hey, we're passing through. And a lot of times we'll stop and right. send the sailors off to spend all their dollars, frankly, and help the economy. But a lot of times an aircraft carrier, let's face it, it's a novelty. And yeah. so if you can bring out the Sultan of Brunei or whatever and let them look around for the day. Oh, by the way, for them, they get a trap and then a cat. Right. And so that's a thrill for them. <laughs> and a patch. And, then, and a patch, that's right. And then off you go. What happens when we get, let's say, to the Persian Gulf, Arabian Gulf, whatever you want to call it, and we're going to operate there, whether it's Afghanistan or Iraq, for the next two or three months? What are you guys doing? What is a typical day for a COD guy? And COD, again, the C2 in this case, what does that look like? Are you guys on the ship? Are you off the ship? What does your day look like? I mean, yeah. for me, let me just set the stage. I'm on the ship until the ship pulls in for some liberty. And then I go fly my mission and I land back on the ship. Now, if I have a problem, I might need to divert. But for the most part, I belong to the ship and I'm there all the time. Is that different for you guys? Yeah, it is pretty different. And you may not recognize that we are in the Navy with a lot of the way we operate. So we will fly off the ship at some point. When I was VRC 40 on the East Coast, we actually flew off in the Mediterranean and we'd fly, get maybe fuel in Amman, Jordan, and then go into Bahrain and be ready to start supporting ops there, let the ship go around um, through the Red Sea. When we were in VRC 30, we'd fly off somewhere in the North Arabian Sea and get set up, get ready for boat ops. So the way we operate in any particular country, I'll use maybe Bahrain as an example, is, for instance, we don't wear our uniforms out in town. It's a um, foreign country, and we're not, you know, we don't want to pose ourselves as a target, so we wear civilian clothes, and we, a lot of times we live out in the community with the locals. And so, depending if the ship wants us there at a certain time, we wake up at 6 a.m., we drive in, we change into our uniforms, we do the daily maintenance on the plane to get them ready, we load people and packs, and we fly, and then... Flying from Bahrain to the North Arabian Sea, it's, oh gosh, I'm guessing, it's been a while since I did it, maybe three hours there. We'll have a 90-minute on-deck period, and then we'll fly back, and then I can guarantee you there's going to be maintenance that needs to be done. There's going to be problems with the plane, and we're going to get those fixed. And so it's probably a, um, I would say, you know, the day starts at 6 a.m., and our guys aren't going home till probably 10 or 12 at night. Um, we break it up into two shifts, but... It is busy. And then I'm not digging for sympathy when I tell you this, but then when the ship pulls in the port, it's time to go party, right? That's not the way it works for the cots. When the ship pulls in the port, that means we get to do all our maintenance, all our heavy maintenance, all the drop checks. Mm -hmm. That's right, because we don't have to do our flying. So that's when we actually have to do a lot more work and the days get even longer. So hmm. that, I don't know if I explained it very well, but that's kind of how our day works is, is we integrate in the community when we are on the land, but we fly out of the right. base. So you guys are part of the team. And of course, we on the carrier appreciate that you bring us mail and various things. But in good nature of naval aviation, there's also some ribbing and kidding and grass is always greener because when you guys are living in Bahrain or wherever, you're getting a little extra money, right? I mean... Yeah, and, and you know, we, we've been told not to talk about that because oh, we don't want right. to upset anybody. Well, but, nobody's listening, but Yeah, so on that note, um, there's a couple things. So this is actually just good judgment. So we are required to stay in places that have a required level of security. So those sometimes are nice hotels. Those mm. are sometimes that have apartments with compounds around them. So that's important. We want our sailors Absolutely. to be safe. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is, I don't know if you've ever bought a bottle of water in Singapore. It's about $15 for about eight <laughs> ounces. And I'm not kidding. Well. So it's expensive. And mm. so if you're going to put sailors out in town, they're going to go broke really quick if you don't give them the substance just to, to make the daily ends meet. So mm. we do get per diem and we do have a nice place to stay. Yeah, but we don't want the truth to get in the way. From an F-18 <laughs> guy's perspective, I see you <laughs> coming out. You're well rested. You've been on the beach. And oh, by the way, you're getting per diem. And meanwhile, I'm stuck on the boat where there's no alcohol, uh, a horrible truth? internet. I, I've never heard of the truth. What? <laughs> All right. I'll let you off the hook on that one. I don't think we talked about it, but what is a typical debt? You said about 40-ish, I think, sailors, but how many air crew and how many aircraft? So two aircraft typically, and it depends on the pilots. It could okay. be anywhere between six and eight, depending on what needs to be done. Okay. And then for air crew, again, between six and eight. And those guys, man, those guys... The air crew have long days because they come in mm -hmm. when they get the plane started, they load. I mean, these guys, their back is just shot by the end of a tour, but they're loading. We hand load our cargo. We don't have those fancy equipments that all the other people do. We hand load every single piece hmm. of a cargo. You guys are helping out. off. Right. Yeah. And then is it just pilots or are there naval flight officers, NFOs in the C2 community? 
Yeah, single anchor only. Okay, pilots. All right. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, will one or more of them also be an LSO and help out with the wing? Oh, yeah. Great point. We've been really supported by the carrier wing and getting LSOs out there. So the field qual LSO is not that rare. I was a field qual, and and a lot of people have become field quals. Mm -hmm. But every now and then we get officers who are able to actually be part of the air wing. And so those guys spend you know, a considerable amount of time on the ship waving all aircraft, even getting qualmed in other aircraft flying. And, <laughs> and if I could just quickly nod my head to one, we had a gentleman, a dear friend of mine named Chris Brenner, is a great COD guy. He was actually a uh, CAG paddles, but he was LSO of the year. Wow. All right. COD well, guy. LSO of the year. Congratulations to him. I'm sure it was well earned. Yeah. And hopefully not just some sort of, oh, we haven't had a COD guy before. So No, he's a great American. Good, he earned good it. for him. All right. Yeah. Well, big shout out to him and his family. All right, dude, let's talk about performance. Now, this is an interesting aircraft because it's intended for logistics. So you might think C-130, C-5, C-17, kind of big and lumbering. But on the other hand, it lands on aircraft carriers. So what's this thing like to fly? How high? How fast? How many Gs? I mean, sometimes you come into the break, but a lot of times when you have DVs, as we call the distinguished visitors, then you just do a straight in to the carrier. But, you know, I know it's been a while since you flew it, but what do you remember doing in this thing as far as performance goes? I'd say that there's two answers to this. First of all, if anybody goes <laughs> online to look at the performance of the C2, it uh, lists it out there. I don't think I've ever seen any of that done. Like, <laughs> I think the max airspeed is like 340 knots. You can do 340 knots in a dive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe. I think the service ceilings is like 30 something thousand. Nope, that's not going to happen. At least I've never seen it happen. So, okay. long story short, to answer your question, it transits maybe in the mid 20s. Okay, so maybe around 20,000 feet. Twenty. I always transit around 22 or 24,000 okay. feet when I was flying the C2. Uh, indicated airspeed, golly, uh, memory's failing right now. Maybe 180 knots indicated. Okay. Sure. So, true airspeed, maybe 250. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, payload. The specs say 10,000 pounds or 26 passengers. It will cube out typically before we carry that much weight. So what I mean by cube out is is we just cannot, the boxes are going to be X amount of sizes. And so we'll, we'll load the cod with cargo and it'll be completely full and we'll only weigh maybe 5,000 pounds. Right. So um, now if we're carrying a complement of 26 passengers, then that cargo room is extremely small because, oh uh, gosh, that's uh, eight rows of aircraft, I think, or, uh, or of, of seats. Yeah. yeah, so there's just not much room. Right. And, and, then, and then that's mainly all sea bags. So one plane we would usually dedicate to passengers and the other one we would kind of gut out and, mm. and make it one big cargo plane. So right. I definitely want to make sure I answer your question. <laughs> the specs online... I haven't seen those actually performed no, that fine. way. I mean, you anecdotally, know. you flew yeah. it in the mid-20s and somewhere around 200 knots. Yeah. Was there a G limit that you remember? I mean, if, if you don't remember it, it probably means it didn't matter. If you came into the break, you rolled and pulled and yeah. you just pulled for a little bit, and that was it. But, uh, you know, as far as that goes, this isn't – you're not doing loops and rolls no. and barrel rolls and stuff in this thing, right? No, and, and I'm sure you could have over g it, I guess, if you wanted to. But, you know, those were times when I was – Feeling, uh, I don't know what the word is, feeling pretty uh, sporty where I would come into the, uh, (laughs) you know, I would dive down, build up the airspeed, and I would break at the stern or the Mm. bow. And uh, you're not going to over G this plane, at least on. (laughs) I mean, you can pull, you're going to yank and bank, and you're going to put max trim on, Uh and you're not going to over G it. Well, what's it like to fly? I mean, is it easy to fly? Is it difficult? Are you. Yeah, great question. So I would say it's not very easy to fly at all. So. Let's just take a basic example, not landing at the ship, because that's not an easy example. So if you're up at cruise altitude, let's say 10,000 feet, and you add power to the plane due to the, oh gosh, I wish sunshine was here. So due to the gyro effects, the torque, right? Mm -hmm. right, The plane's going to actually twist and turn. And so when you add power, you're going to need to add right rudder. And and the nose is going to pop up. So now you got to lower the nose a little, add a little right rudder, and, and then trim it out, right? When you pull power, what's going to happen? Well, the nose is now going to left, and it's going to drop. So I would say it's a very difficult plane to fly well. Um, we don't have an autopilot. We have an out hold, which... Altitude hold? It doesn't okay. really work. In fact, anytime we used it, we had to brief the out-of-control procedures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true okay. story. So um, we have... Manually fly the thing. Right. right. I've got a lot of manual time flying all over the world, all over the country, wow. uh, flying manual stick. It's definitely a hard plane to fly. And then landing it aboard the ship... I don't know what to say about that. It's tough. You don't really think about it. You just learn the muscle memory to do it. An acquired skill. 
Right. You know, we didn't really talk about this earlier, but we hinted at it, and that is that both engines turn the propeller in the same direction. Yeah. Unlike certain aircraft that are designed differently to be more in balance. And the reason for that, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we don't need to have two gearboxes or two different engines everywhere we go. Right. We want them to do the same thing so that one can replace both. Yeah, that's right. And again, I'm going from memory. It's been a few years since I've done this, but the engines, I think, are rated at 4,600 horsepower, shaft tower, each one, 4,600 shaft horsepower. Now that's a Navy limitation, you know, 4,600 shaft horsepower with an option to go a little higher than that. But I think Grumman, or excuse me, Allison was the original manufacturing engine and Royal mm. Royce owns them now. You know, I've heard several times from the reps that these engines go much higher. And just a very, very, very quick short C story was um, Brian uh, Peterson, call sign Butters and Sean Waldron Walrus. These guys had a cold cap off the uh, USS Dennis, like literally this catapult broke. And so they went down the catapult at like literally like 70 knots. They went to flaps 30, they brought the gear up and then they just put the throttles to firewall. Well, unlike the E2 and other aircraft, we don't have an electronic governor. We don't have any of that. Mm. We, if we go max power, we will over torque and over temp the engines. Mm. And so they said both engines went up to 6,000 shaft horsepower and they flew it out and survived wow. and the engines were still functioning after that so amazingly powerful engines i don't know how many single engines landings i have i probably have over a dozen single engine landings really? and i oh yeah and i the plane flies very well single engine at least when the other prop is feathered yes well that's a whole separate discussion were any of those landings on the ship nope oh no well, very thankful. fortunate yeah, yeah i'm very oh, fortunate for that probably. yeah and what was your come aboard speed in that? Do you recall? I mean, it seems like when you see the videos on YouTube that you've got all day compared to an <laughs> F-18, yeah. but was it fairly slow and, and controllable, I suppose? I mean, I know you're busy in there, but... Yeah. Our trap weight was 49,000 pounds, so we would take off. That's a whole other complicated discussion. So we would take off when we couldn't take more fuel mm -hmm. than we could needed to land at the ship with the appropriate amount to land, have another pass, and then divert. So our trap weight was 49,000 pounds, so we could take off maybe at 58,000 pounds, and we'd actually burn down, what is that math, uh, 9,000 9, pounds of yeah. fuel. So, But then we'd need a couple thousand to divert, but then we would land, and man, you're really light at that weight. You're extremely light, and mm. so the power is really are very sensitive. But at 49,000 pounds, I'm guessing it's like a hundred and uh, maybe 110 or 115 oh, okay. knots yeah, indicated. That's, I mean, relatively slow. I think that's what Stephen Kuhn said the A6 came aboard at. But for comparison purposes, the F-18, at least the legacy, as I recall, was generally in the 130, you know, mid-130s, depending on how heavy you were. And so that's you know, 30 knots is a little bit of time difference as far as reacting to the ball and worrying about lineup. And again, we've already talked about it, but meatball lineup angle of attack for you guys, for me and my stubby winged F-18, I could get away with a little bit of left or right. You guys had to be right on center line. Yeah. And um, there's examples of there when that didn't work out well, when they went out to LA and, mm -hmm. and there was uh, swap paint. Okay. One last thing maybe worth mentioning is we could take off at 57.5 on the catapults. And that was a hefty speed. I don't remember what the end speed was at, maybe like 145 or 150, but that was a healthy catapult right. shot. Sure. And other than redlining, like your story, I mean, it's not like you have afterburner you can select or jettison external stores to make yourself a little better like I had in the F-18. I mean, you've got what you got. And boy, what a testimony to those guys. Like you said, the cold cat. So in other words, they're going down, they should have a whole lot more, and they end up trickling off the end of the catapult or the aircraft carrier, I should say, at 70 or 80 knots and still flew the thing away. Of course, they didn't have much choice, right? I mean, can you guys bail out of this thing? Do you wear parachutes? Do you have ejection seats? What? No ejection seats. Mm -hmm. uh, no parachutes when we carry passengers for the obvious reasons. Because You know, <laughs> you don't want to bail and leave them on their own? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about commitment. You're committed to that plane, and we train for that. We train yeah. for riding it to the last second. Wow. Well, next up is strengths and weaknesses. Now, again, given that this is a fairly limited scope of mission for this aircraft. I mean, it does it well, like you said, and it sounds like very adaptable to changes and various things, but any significant, like, I uh, forget what uh, aircraft it was, but, oh, it was the A-10, you know, who was it? Supa said, man, if they just had the more powerful engines. I mean, anything that sticks out in your mind as kind of the thorn of your career, like, wow, I wish they had just fixed this one thing, or anything strength-wise that just made you really have an affectionate affinity for the aircraft? I would say 
99% of the time, I felt that that plane was always going to get me where I was going to go. I'd say there was probably one or two times in my career where I wasn't sure if it was going to work out. It did, obviously. But it's a very, very good plane to fly. If you lose an engine and you're you're not in a slow, low situation, then you're going to have a good chance of working it out. Mm-hmm. It's strong. It's good. And um, the more you flew it, the better you got at it. So I, I'd say... The strengths of it are is um, it does what it's designed to do. Mm-hmm. I think you asked for weaknesses too, sure. right? Again, it's not versatile. It does one thing. And, and um, I don't want to go on any negative tangents here, but I'd say if it, the negative part, maybe we, we just never had parts, you know, and that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> but there just were some parts and that's not right. exclusive to the C2 Greyhound. No, certainly not. We had a hard time getting parts yeah. and uh, maybe just the difficult of flying it in the extreme situations, a pitching deck, weather and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. It, it, that's what made me... And I don't remember if this came out before, but nowadays, I don't think it was always this way, but you guys are basically daytime only. You can do poor weather, but you don't generally fly to the carrier at night. Is that correct? No, there's no more night operations now. We'll definitely get as close as we can, whether mm-hmm. it's a sunrise recovery or sunset recovery. Mm-hmm. But no, no more ops. Can you leave the ship at night? That depends on operational necessity. And okay. I know that there's been times in the past where there's been a medevac where someone's life was... Uh, in so need of attention. You calculate the risk at that point. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you have the right crew do that. Yeah. You just, yeah. Speaking of uh, medevac, isn't there a configuration I thought I read where you can have certain amount of letters or leaders? I don't know what you call it, but right. In case you have a mass casualty type situation, you have people on stretchers. Is there a situation for that? I mean, it's modular inside, I assume, right? So you can yeah. have all kinds of configurations. Yeah. You know, I haven't thought about that in years and okay. there's a story just, <laughs> I'll, I'll make it brief, but there's a situation. So, Shore to shore, I, oh gosh, shore to shore, I think we can do like maybe six liters. And a liter is, a, is another word for a stretcher, right? Right, right? We can put them on the side there. But now going from ship to shore, you'd never go shore to ship with a medevac, but going ship to shore, there's a couple ways you can do that. And you put the leader perpendicular in the fuselage. And so you have a row of seats there. And then you put the leader just forward of the seats. So the, the leader is wedged in the seats and you actually get big, big, tie down straps i'm talking like these big 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 nylon straps mm-hmm. and you you cinch the patient down in the leader into the well into the idea the being is that we're obviously doing this for emergent reasons and it's right. maybe the least bad option but right. speaking of that we didn't really say it but the passengers sit backwards facing don't yeah. they yeah yeah you know as long as I flew the cot, I wish I knew exactly why that was, but it's my understanding it's for the egress. So if, for instance, okay. if there's an emergency, that ramp is right there and those hatches are in the back. And so okay. they're going to be primed to just, it's going to be go, just go right. forward, just get out forward. Right. Okay. Speaking of that, those who don't have a chance to do it day in, day out, like we did, always, you know, just rail about how cool it was to be in a catapult shot on a cod and then again if they're lucky enough to come back around for the trap because from their point of view it's pretty violent but it shoots you quickly and you come to a stop quickly and i always thought maybe it was face backwards for the trap so that your head yeah just goes into the seat but on the other hand it goes flying forward when you cat so i don't know you know we've had people hold things in their hand and and they think that they can brace themselves when you're doing a fifty-seven thousand pound cat there's no Marvel character. There's no <laughs> Superman. There's no one who can hold themselves down. And you see a lot of things flying. When it's not stowed, it's that, flying. Yeah. yeah, that's never good. All right, dude, let's move on to notoriety. Now, you guys are kind of the unsung heroes, but where would our listener have seen a C2 Greyhound, whether it's in Hollywood or in the news? I mean, has this thing gotten any silver screen time? Yeah, I'm not the person to ask for that. I can give you a couple of things, though. So the notoriety is is obviously people know it just from, hey, the cod is the lifeline to the ship. But as for Hollywood... Uh, let me think here. The first thing I'll think of is is I actually kind of like this scene. There's a scene in the Hunt for Red October where Jack Ryan is going out to the carrier, right? Mm-hmm. And he's riding in the cod, and there's some light turbulence, and, and the cod pilot's <laughs> trying to calm him down, saying, it's not actually that bad, right? Yeah. So it's actually a pretty good scene. Yeah. But the problem with it, when they're about to land in the ship, they show an E2 That's landing. Right. It's like, uh-huh. are you kidding me? And, and like in the dark, too, by the way. <laughs> right, 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 right. I guess in Tears of the Sun, there's a uh, high altitude steel insertion um, but then they have another plane it's messy the french are familiar with the c2 there was an actual cod detachment that was stationed aboard the charles de gaulle for a while there Mm -hmm. they've done ops there but then they actually worked with charles de gaulle cool you know it's impossible to remember all the cameos that's made i'm sure there's a lot of famous ones that i forgot one that i think i was particularly famous with and i actually tried looking it up 
before you came. There's a TMZ video of, I guess the leapfrogs were jumping out of one of our cods and they were doing it over Hollywood. So we had two cods fly directly over Hollywood and the leapfrogs jumped out of our C2s with these like pyrotechnics off their suits and like, and TMZ covered it of all people covering it. And then they made this <laughs> funny comment on it. Uh-huh. And, and so that one I kind of liked, but I couldn't find it. Uh, um, so anyway, that's what I got. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, unfortunately, in certain circumstances, there are aircraft that you never hear about until something bad happens. And thankfully, the C2 has a pretty decent safety record. But I want to say, wasn't there a mishap about a year and a half ago, November uh, or fall of 17, near Japan? And one of our fellow crewmen from the depot was aboard, I want to say. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, that made um, a little news, as I recall. Yeah, I wish I knew a lot about that. I wish I knew more about that. That was uh, one of the pilots was Stephen Combs, and then the sailors in the back, uh, Matthew Chalistri. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, and then Brian Grosso. Uh, those um, gentlemen did not survive the crash. Yeah. I don't have any information on that crash. I wish I did. I would like to add maybe just a personal note on it, um, and maybe this pertains not necessarily to the crash, but just to the overall COD community. I didn't know Stephen Combs. I feel like I did know him, though. He was a COD guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, I flew that plane he flew. I flew with this pilot. I flew with the guy in the back. I cruised with those guys. Uh, I even had an engine failure. But I didn't have an engine failure like he did. He mm-hmm. had an engine failure where he was low and slow, and uh, it was tough. But, you know, we trained for that because as a, as a C2 pilot, we train for ditching. We train for engine failures. We train for engine failures down low. And I'd like to think that, that some of that training paid off because eight people survived that crash at sea. And I don't know how that happened. That's something short of a miracle. And so, again, I, I didn't know Stephen Combs, but I'd like to think that I didn't know him because I, I used to do what he did. And... And he saved my friends and he saved a lot of the people. So God bless him. And, you know, maybe just to put things in perspective, the last C2 fatality was in 1973. And so if you take 1973 to November of 2017, that's 44 years without a fatality. So I'd like to maybe just think about what other aircraft community out Mm -hmm. there can say, hey, in the 44 years that we've been flying, we've never had a fatality. And oh, by the way, we fly to the ship. Mm. We fly to the ship in the most demanding environment where that aircraft carrier is pitching. I've seen it pitch like a toy in a bathtub where the screws are coming out of the water, where there's sandstorms, where there's zero visibility. We're doing talk downs. We're doing it in the most extreme situations and we're doing it safely. And we're doing it, when you step on board that cod, we're doing it with a solemn promise that we're going to, Make sure that it works out because we're damn good at our job and we're damn good at delivering people safely. So so my hat's off to them and the entire COD community. That was a loss not only for VRC30, but the entire COD community and maybe anybody who's ever even rode on a COD. Well, it certainly strikes close to home and I appreciate your vulnerability, brother. I mean, we are brothers in arms and it, it hurts, but you also know that he did what he could. And like you said, some people did swim away, I suppose, walk away, but... It is hard to reflect on something like that and not be emotionally attached. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Dude, I think we're just about out of stuff to talk about here, although I'm sure we could go on. But what about for you? Did you have any good sea stories in the C2 Greyhound? You had, how many hours did you end up accruing in this thing? Uh, that's a great question. And how many traps? You know, uh, um, I guess I should have told you I was going to ask you this. That's a sore subject of mine, JLO. I was a, a C2 instructor in the fleet squadrons, okay. but, but we're not allowed to log our traps from the right seat. And respectively so, okay. respectively so, but I did a lot of the seats from the right, <laughs> a lot of traps from the right seat, teaching yeah. guys to come down, at least after they, they should have done. Do you only down. land from the left seat then? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you're uh, riding along, I mean, you're not riding along, you're part of the crew, but you don't, the guy on the left logs the landing, the guy on the right does not. That's right. Okay. And even if you're the aircraft commander in the right-hand seat, you don't log the huh. trap. And yeah. so... I was a T-45 instructor pilot, and so I think I have maybe 300 traps, but right. a lot of those are T-45, so I don't, I don't know how many C-2 mm. traps I have. I've never right. counted that up. It's never been something that I tracked. I don't have 2,000 hours because I would probably have the patch if I did, but I have probably close to 2,000 hours in the C-2 and then maybe right. another 1,000 hours doing other stuff. 
Was there anything ever harrowing that you had in the C2 or any particular sea story you'd like to share with folks yeah, before we wrap up? Yeah, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I have my fair share, you know, and I won't get into that, but landing at the ship without a ball or, <laughs> or um, you know, engine failures where you, you're like, wow, this, how is this going to turn out? There is one story that I'd like to, to share, and, and I'm going to try and make it concise, but at the same time, try and res- pay respects to the COD crews that did this. And so this is not my sea story, but one of the honors I had after I served in the Navy was I was asked to speak at a friend's retirement. And so I did some digging and I wanted to come up with a story about him and during his retirement. And so I did some digging and here's what I found. But so here it is. So my friend, Jason Buckley was a COD guy. He was the officer in charge of debt one. And there was a lot of great COD guys on that debt. I could go on, you know, uh, Matt and Brian, all these guys, but they're on cruise and they're on the USS Ronald Reagan. They're flying from the USS Ronald Reagan to Osan, Korea. So uh, ship to Osan, Korea, but they mm-hmm. have to make a fuel stop in Atsugi. And I think it's like- Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Japan. So they have to make a fuel stop in Japan, which is like, it's like 800 miles away from the ship. So as luck would have it, they get a problem on the ship and they get airborne late where they're now they're kind of hurting on fuel and the winds change. And sure enough, what happens is one of the planes, the plane that my buddy Jason in, it gets low on fuel. And so he's heading into Japan and there's usually some dead spots, you know, we weren't here VHF or UHF and, and HF work sometimes. So as they get closer, they hear uh, Tokyo air traffic start holding all the aircraft, you know, he, um, United hold, Delta hold, all these guys are holding. And so they get this uh, sinking feeling that things are bad. So ultimately they get told to hold and, and Jason decides they just can't hold it and have the fuel. So he says, hey, I'm declaring emergency and I, I just can't hold. So the air traffic controller says, hey, we just had a major earthquake here in, in Japan. The airspace is closed. So long story short, the field at Atsugi is not damaged. So they're able to, the CODs are able to go in and land and they get low fuel lights and they land in in Japan. And and for any aviator who understands low fuel lights, that means you're on the clock and it's a fairly um, stressful situation. So they land, right? And, and my friend Jason gets out of the plane and he's met by the base CEO. He's just happy to be out of the plane and safe on deck. And mm-hmm. the base CEO walks up to him and says, hey, you need to get out of here now. Get gas and get out of here. This country is having a national disaster. And what they didn't really realize at that time was actually the tsunami waves were hitting. This so, is March 2011. Thank you. Mm-hmm. March 2011. It's crazy, right? So they get airborne and they start going to Osan. They're happy to be out of the country, Japan, because things are just going to go crazy. And one of the C2s has an emergency. So they have to... So safety in numbers. So then they divert into Iwakuni. So now Jason's at his wit, you know, not at his wit ends, but he's like, man, what a day, right? What a day. So they land at Iwakuni. So let's fix the plane. Let's get out of here. Maybe you have to spend the night. So he calls back to the ship and he says, hey, listen, we're safe in Iwakuni, but you would not believe what's going on here. And the ship's like, yeah, we know what's going on there. Do you know what's going on there? I'm like, yeah. Hey, get your plane fixed. Get back in that Sugi and you're going to start humanitarian assistance and disaster relief immediately. And so if you can just imagine, they're trying to get out of the country and, and now they're being ordered to get right back in the mix of it. So they fly back in on Saturday. Gosh, I don't remember, but it was March 12th the next day. So now they find that Sugi and they're going to start doing uh, humanitarian relief out of that Sugi. The tsunami hit 30 foot waves up to 10 miles, uh, excuse me, six miles inland, 30 foot waves, and it destroyed the north part of the country, the countryside bad, you know, unrecognizably. The reactors, not to get too far into this, but it's important to know that when the earthquake hit, shut down the reactors, and then the tsunami took out the backup generators. So now there's no cooling for the reactors. Nuclear reactors in Japan. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So the very first day they get back in Atsugi on March 12th, one of the reactors actually explodes. So now you've got aftershocks, you've got radioactive plume, and now they're just starting day one of their <laughs> humanitarian relief. So for a couple of weeks, they did humanitarian relief out of Atsuki going to the north of Japan up in the Misawa. It was snowing in Misawa. So the air, the water, the dirt, everything was contaminated with radioactive material. Not only that, but the plumes were there. On the next day after the tsunami, one reactor exploded. Two days later, another one exploded. And then the, I think on the fourth day, two other reactors exploded. So they're having to do their flight paths in and around these radioactive plumes the whole time they're delivering, you know, supplies and water to people up in Japan who, in their very time of need, you know, need somebody. And and I think that it's just 
another example of how the C2s operate. Um, anytime, any place, they're going to be there to give assistance when they can. And, and um, I don't think a lot of people know that story. There's a lot more to it, and I'm just giving you the highlights there. But I think the entire community is proud of those guys for what they did, and I don't think they got much recognition for it. Hmm. Now, you know, a couple of weeks after things settle down, the aftershocks and the radioactive plumes, now the big mobility commands come in. They're able to bulldoze the runways clear. They're able to dry things out. And now the real assets are able to come in and help. And that's when they kind of kick us out because mm-hmm. we can land and do a lot of things in a lot of small places. But then when it's clear, the big airplanes will come mm-hmm. in and bring in more assistance. So that's a very short version of that story. They are American heroes. They established and did a beautiful thing for the country of Japan. They strengthened the relationship with the country of Japan. And, and, and the most beautiful thing of all was they served humans. They, they served humanity, and, and I'm proud of them. Amen. Well, and at no risk, or how do I put this, right? There was risk to themselves, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I just can't find the words. But I remember reading that the Ronald Reagan had to, at the end of the Tomodachi, I believe they called the operation to support Japan, had to destroy, like, even clothing that air crew were wearing that flew into those regions because they were radioactive. And equipment was affected. And there was, I mean, I assume there's a lot of people that have marks in their medical records from being exposed to that. Yeah, like I said earlier, it, it's a very, very, I give you the very, very cliff notes of it, but you're talking about the aircraft had to be scrubbed daily. Clothes had to be destroyed. destroyed. Yeah. The air, the water, the snow was all contaminated. Then they're wearing Geiger counters when they're flying. And so... Operating a sea detachment is hard enough. Yeah. And now you add earthquakes and a radioactive plume. These guys, they're... And they did it. They're American heroes. Yeah. They're awesome. Awesome. Well, someone ought to make a movie about that because you guys deserve your day in the in the sun. Thanks. Awesome, dude. Well, hey, this has been a lot of fun and I, I appreciate the level of enthusiasm, but also seriousness you bring to the C2 and this mission. And um, again, it's not the most heralded, but man, is it vital. And these guys are doing real quality work out there, making a difference in the lives of the sailors day in and day out, but also our allies in their time of need. And yeah. that's just awesome. All right, buddy, we're going to transition to the ending here and we'll start with you. I mean, you've got a great little patch of heaven out here in the Pacific Northwest. You've got, you showed me earlier, a little patch of orchard of uh, apples and blueberries and different things. I mean, what's the future hold for you? Are you, you, you riding into the credits here into the sunset or are you in your happy place? Yeah. But besides having uh, Washington's best bocce ball court, but besides that, is that what you're wanting to know? <laughs> That's right. I'm an airline pilot and I enjoy it. I'm a flight instructor as well. And I really enjoy it. I'm trying to be uh, a great dad. I'm trying to grow apples. I'm trying to do a lot of bird hunting and uh, I'm just high on life. I'm very fortunate. I've got a great wife and a great family and and great friends like you and and uh that's it i'm just hanging out trying to be a good dad well that's awesome i tell you when we pulled up to the place i was already a little jealous because you're out here among the trees and you have some space not like i have in san diego but then you open your garage and what do i see hanging around in this garage is you know bibs for hunting skis on the wall bikes and unicycles you got like a unicycle with a big dirt tire on it for heaven's <laughs> sakes You've got it all going here, buddy. So you didn't I'm, mention my tractor. And the tractor. John that's right. Deere. You need to let me go drive that thing. Yeah. And a massive bocce ball court in your own backyard, which is next to your barbecue grill and outdoor fireplace and everything else. So I might have to uh, move in. Cool. Jayla. Come on. Come on. <laughs> all right, dude. Well, your call sign sounds like a relatively easy one, but tell us how or why or when someone came up with JLo for Julio Galvan. I'll tell you, the, the reason I did this podcast was only to clear the record on this one. I didn't care about doing one for the C2. I just wanted the opportunity to clear my name. Okay, so I've been waiting for a long time to clear right, the record. For this so, moment. So, oh, and we're out of time. So thanks very much. No. So for the record... I did not have a dance off with Jennifer Lopez. Okay. I'm not related to Jennifer Lopez. I have acted like a diva in the past where I felt like <laughs> people thought it was okay to call me JLo, but that's not why I got my call sign. And then it does not stand for, I forgot what it's called, like Jovial Latin Org or something like that. So none of those things are true. And so that's a true story. <laughs> um, the, the truth of the matter is, it's a play on my first name. My first name is Julio, J-U-L-I-O. And if you drop the U and the I, you're left with J-L-O. And a skipper of mine, Skipper Fago, back at VRC40, he gave me that call sign and it stuck. It stuck. 
All right. Yeah. Well, I know there was some confusion for the what eight months we overlapped at the depot. <laughs> yeah. JLo and Jello, and yeah. if I abbreviated mine, then it got confusing. But it also helped us to hide because we could always say, "Oh, I thought That's that was right. for the other That's guy." That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Awesome, buddy. Well, dude, I say we quit rolling tape here so that we can go do all these other fun things we got planned for the rest of our day. But this has been amazing. I think you have paid the proper testimony to the C2 Greyhound, the unsung hero of the Carrier Strike Group. Dude, unless you got some parting shots here, I think we can wrap this up. Thanks for what you're doing, Jello. Thanks for what you're doing for Naval Nation. I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. I enjoy what I'm doing. People seem to appreciate it. And, you know, we're going to include aircraft like the C2 because your story needs to be told too. So Thanks. I think we did it. Awesome. Let's get out of here. All right. See ya. Wow, Jello. What an interview. And I got to give props to JLo because I know it's really difficult, but when the topic gets close to your heart, at least for me, I know that I get all overclimped, right, and get tight. So I sincerely appreciate him kind of showing his vulnerability there when talking about his fallen friends. You know, it's funny because after we hit stop, he felt a little sheepish about it. And I said, no, no, JLo, this is gold. People are going to no, love it. No, no, so, no, no. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, yeah. we're all big, tough guys in the military, but we have a soft spot. And uh, certainly he showed his and I'm with him. I, I agree. And I agree with you. So yeah, great interview. You know, darn my public education, though, Sunshine. I think I said intonation, <laughs> which is, of course, the rise and fall of the pitch of your voice, like I just demonstrated. And what I meant was the implication of being behind enemy lines. Ah. And then I think a stretcher is a, what, litter, not a leader, like a liter of soda? <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's a litter. Yeah, All exactly. right, a litter. All right. And then after we recorded, J-Lo sent me a quick email, and he wanted me to kind of set the record straight for okay. everybody. And I'll just read what he wrote. He said, on the sea story about the debt one CODs from the Ronald Reagan, I failed to mention, and this is... JLo talking. I failed to mention the U.S. Navy ordered an evacuation of all non-essential personnel, which pretty much meant everyone, including Air Wing 5. However, the Air Wing 5 Detachment 5 did stay behind and participated in Operation Tomodachi along with Debt 1. So there was two different debts, and I think he just alluded to one. And then he continues, also the Hilo debts were just as vital. The CODs and helicopter folks pulled off some amazing stuff in an extremely unstable environment that no one will probably ever fully understand. Sunshine, I remember I had just moved to San Diego and that went down. I still had a lot of friends there, and some of their families ended up coming out to San Diego because they had to get the heck out of Dodge. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And then also, he got back to me about CNSATM, Communication, Navigation, Surveillance, Air Traffic Management. Remember, that's their avionics system in the cockpit. And then lastly, he did find the TMZ YouTube video, and we're going to put a link to that in the show notes. So, nice. Sunshine, the big hanging chat for me on this thing is, man, I was tripping over myself on this <laughs> P-Factor thing. So, Reader's Digest version, P-Factor for dummies, straighten me out if you would, please. Yeah, dude. Well, no, I thought you and JLo did a good job. So, um, but your hanging chad wasn't too big of a hanger, we'll call it. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so P factor, yeah. So there are a couple things that uh, play into his flight or handling characteristics behind the boat. But let's talk about P factor. So P factor is caused by the asymmetric angle of attack of each of the blades. So think of the blades, the prop really has got, we'll just go with four. I know he mentioned eight also, but just got four. Well, they're all the same shape, right? So if you think of a wing, Lift will be produced by both the shape or the camber plus the angle of attack. Okay. Well, now think of the disc of four wings, if you will, and they're spinning around. When you move that disc with respect to the airflow or the slipstream hitting it, you're going to have different angles of attack for different positions on the rotor disc. So as a, let's say a downgoing wing could actually have a higher angle of attack than an upgoing wing based on if that disc pitch or really the pitch of the aircraft, the nose is pitched higher up. Uh-huh. And so what happens is normally on a disc, you'd like to have a resultant thrust vector right through the center of the disc. But because the downgoing blades produce more lift than the upgoing blades, that thrust vector, that effective or resultant vector, actually migrates a little bit away from center to one side and favors one side of the disc. So what you have is a kind of an unbalanced torque now on the disc itself, which is going to cause the disc, 
which is attached to the aircraft to actually turn either right or left. And traditionally for us, it's going to be turning to the left. All right, hold on, Sunshine. the right rudder. I got to stop because I'm a visual person. So let's say I'm standing behind the airplane. Yeah. And the propellers are frozen in time. And there's one exactly at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. Got it. And let's say just so we're all visualizing the same thing, we're looking at the right engine. So what you're saying is the blade at 3 o'clock and the blade at 9 o'clock are in a different sort of relative angle of attack and so the blade at three and the blade at nine are going to have their own little mini torque on that overall disc where the blades are spinning yes almost so instead of taking a snapshot and keep in mind that the left and the right are going to change based on the direction of rotation so for our american okay. designs it's predominantly clockwise as you know so okay yes the down going blade so let's look at the arc scribe from 12 o'clock to six o'clock all right versus the other arc that's scribed by the six o'clock to the 12 o'clock the up going well now Take that disc and let's just make it a trash can lid, okay? All right. So now that trash can lid is going to be aligned with the probably the airframe. And on takeoff, it's kind of cocked up. So the wind is coming straight in your face, but the trash can lid is kind of cocked up. So you have an angular difference, if ah, that makes sense. Yeah. So so what's going to happen is the, the blades that are going from 12 o'clock and sweeping downward to the 6 o'clock position actually have a slightly higher relative angle of attack. And because they have a slightly higher relative angle of attack than the upgoing blades, okay, because they're kind of, the upgoing blades, remember how they're kind of canted backward, if you right. will. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you have a little more lift on the, in this case, on the right side, which is going to be the 12 to 6 o'clock sector, and less lift on the 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock on the left-hand side. So the thrust vector, the resultant vector out of the disc, the whole disc itself, when you take all the little finite elements and add them up, the thrust vector is actually migrated a little bit toward the three o'clock position ah and, and that's, so that's going to cause a tilt on that disc gotcha and so that's why one of the engines is the critical engine because it's actually further away from the fuselage and the rudders than the other as far as well that, okay that force right well so the definition of a critical engine is the engine whose failure brings more adverse effect or more adverse ah, yaw okay so once again for our our western we'll call it design of clockwise flow or clockwise rotation excuse me Look at the engines, and it's the engine that has the downgoing blade closest to the wingtip. That is traditionally going to be the critical engine. Okay. So if, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in the E2 or C2 in this example, if I lose the right engine, then, well, hold on. Isn't it the other engine? Because it's the one with the most force. Okay, my eyes are starting to cross. But the point being is that <laughs> closer to the wingtip, it's a bigger deal, in other words, if you lose the left engine or the right depending on which way the blades are spinning. Yeah, and it's a bigger deal at higher alpha, which is traditionally lower speed. Ooh, like right, right? in takeoff and landings. Exactly, okay. and also at higher power. So that kind of, uh. not totally rules out landing, but it's more influential. If you remember, now I know you and I are old, <laughs> and we had the T-34, but do you remember when you took the power control lever, the PCL, and you firewalled it, pushed uh -huh. it all the way forward, you had to add right rudder automatically. Well, eventually you learned to do it automatically. Right. But that's because of the rotation and basically the migration of the effective lift vector from the disc center to basically closer to the three o'clock position. All right. That's well. exactly right. But you know what? Before I lose total consciousness, let me, uh, <laughs> let me muster up the rest of my dork squad here. Right. So we talked about P factor. Now when, um, and I, I'll tell you what, I had total props for the COD guys coming in. I kind of thought of the Hornet guys coming in at, you know, one mid 130s, 145-ish, whatever. We were more of the synthesizer guys. What I mean by that is you just push a button and everything happens. So mm -hmm. think of the old Casio keyboard where you hit organ and you got the background music and everything's already automated for you. <laughs> Whereas the C2 guys, they're more of the organ player, right? It's all manual. They got both hands moving. They got their, their feet moving. I mean, it's kind of like, what's the adage? A, a monkey doing something with a football anyway. So those guys <laughs> are just going to town, right? Right. Well, and the reason I mention that is they have other things that they're fighting. It's not only the P factor, but they have prop wash. So the propeller is not only pulling air through it, it's also imparting a spin on it. So you get these kind of helical patterns. Oh, geez. So the helical patterns are going to, some of the, it's going to be a side force. It's going to you know, impinge upon the, the airframe. So you got that. You also have the prop torque. So when you look at Newton's third law, which says with every uh, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the prop is spinning one way. It's going to impart a torque. Now, granted, the, the fuselage is much bigger, but it's going to impart a torque in the opposite direction. So you got the, the torque factor there. You got the prop wash. We already talked about the P factor. And finally, the last one that you guys touched on a little was gyroscopic precession. <laughs> so, Jello, I want you to close your eyes, get into trance, and I want you to think back to high school physics. Okay. Think about a rope hanging from the ceiling. Now, think about a bicycle wheel hanging 
It's got a peg through the middle of the bicycle wheel, and one end of the peg is tied to that rope. Mm -hmm. Now, the student's going to pick up the other end of the peg, and he's going to start to spin it. And as he spins it fast enough, he's going to go ahead and release his hand from the other side of the peg, not attached to the rope, and the thing kind of floats on its own. Mm -hmm. And that's the gyroscopic effect, which just says, basically, you can apply a force to a gyroscope. In this case, it's a prop arc, right? Mm -hmm. And the resultant force, or the reaction, really, is 90 degrees later, so it's out of phase by 90 degrees, in the direction of rotation. So, point being is the, the gyroscope, the prop arc, as you pitch up and down, it's going to put a force either on the top or the bottom of that disc arc, and the reaction will be 90 degrees later, which will be either to the, in your example, the 3 o'clock or the 9 o'clock position, and that's going to cause another yaw, if you will, if that makes sense. All right. So you've got those four factors anyway, and I'm done. All right. So for everyone who had to pull over to uh, make sure you weren't uh, overwhelmed while you were driving by that, thanks very much. You can uh, get back on the road. <laughs> that's good stuff, Sunshine. You have a very eloquent way of explaining it. I guess the point you were making, though, is that is part of the reason it's such a difficult aircraft to bring aboard the carrier, because when you're making all those very small power corrections, it's not just power. It's everything else on the airplane. Oh, boy, is it. It's y'all and everything. You got yeah. it exactly, Jello. All righty. Well, uh, let's see. JLo and I did try to do a behind the scenes that night, but uh, for whatever reason, my laptop just wasn't cooperating. So we don't have that available, even though we said that we might. And then, of course, we have all these new terms that we can add to the glossary. But again, I just want to thank JLo for the wonderful interview and explanations. And I really thought he did the Greyhound justice. That he did. And I really loved how he talked about, uh, I think I used to call it the executive tale, but the one of the four vert stabs that doesn't have a rudder doesn't seem to do much, but it looks pretty. So I just, just good on it, man. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, good stuff. All right, perfect. Well, this is the point in the show. We always want to remind the listeners that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. We'd like to thank our new Patreon strike lead, Joseph Carraway, and Mission Commander Will Hales. And Sunshine, I have a new way I want to end this episode are you up for something new giddy up roll the bones all right so let's take a listen to this from our upcoming guest hello everybody coming up next on the fighter pilot podcast is the eurofighter typhoon with me lieutenant colonel lawrence enzo shuffle over don't miss it you've been listening to the fighter pilot podcast brought to you by bvr productions got a question for the show send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show, and don't forget to share us with your network. Thanks for listening.